In this slide, we're talking about the importance of recognizing the seizure, and that's recognizing when a seizure is occurring and whether or not this episode is different than a previous one. And then we really want to know, is are these seizures coming on more frequently? Are they lasting longer? Because these are all telltale signs that there's something wrong and uh, we need that help right away. And we have to be able to understand how to recognize a postictal state, and that's when somebody's obtunded and they're kind of... For lack of a better way to put this, they're uh, basically kind of resetting, right? The, it's just like you rebooting your computer. It takes a little while for all the files to kind of get organized and start coming up online before you can log in and start checking your email, right? The brain goes through a very similar process. When they're in that postictal state, just the core systems are coming up on the line and they're acting normally again before we get to that part where the logic center is involved again. Uh, supportive care, right? We're looking at other problems associated with the seizure. Did they fall? Have they struck themselves? Are they bleeding? Do they have trauma? Uh, have they hurt themselves from significant contractions where maybe they've uh, injured a muscle or a uh, long bone? And then again, that postictal state, right? They're usually flaccid or mostly flaccid. And then uh, it can resemble a stroke. Uh, Typically, I tend to look for both pupils being dilated or what we would call blown. Uh, and that usually tells me that that person uh, is having a global event instead of a uh, single hemisphere. That's one of the tricks that I use for determining the difference between a stroke and a seizure. And then obviously, if somebody knows that patient, you're looking for uh, somebody to give you history on the patient. Now we're just talking about altered mental status. And this is really kind of a no-brainer. I'm not going to get too way off into the weeds on this one. Um, but is this patient thinking clearly? I mean, when you're talking to somebody, you guys are assessing whether or not somebody understands you, if they're acting appropriately, just by your uh, repetition of interacting with people throughout your entire lives, right? And so if you have somebody who's acting inappropriately or confused or they're inappropriately lethargic. These people have altered mental status and that's when we're going kind of down that, you know, AEIU tips algorithm so that you can kind of help determine what it is that's causing this mentation status to have changed from what you consider to be a normal competent person, you know, whether or not that's a child or an adult, right? We, we all understand how people actually should operate day to day uh, normally. And if somebody falls outside of that parameter, just kind of go through the algorithm and see if you can see an external or intrinsic cause to this. Uh, and then always try to find out what that patient's baseline is when they are what they consider normal. So now we're talking that altered mental status still, right? Causes. And this is AEIU tips. Again, you guys can go through that. I hope that everybody has that committed to memory. Syncope, which is uh, Latin for fainting, right? So we've got that sudden loss of consciousness. And then uh, when somebody loses consciousness, they just become flaccid. And we've talked about this ad nauseum where uh, if you're protecting an airway because a patient's unconscious, it's because they're flaccid and they're unable to have any muscle tone. And so when somebody faints, they usually just fall into a huddled mess on the floor and uh, we can have all sorts of different reasons for that, right? Good thing is syncope is generally short-lived, uh, doesn't last very long because uh, at that point, if it's uh, increased in duration, we're really, really concerned with what's happening. And this might not just be syncope, this just might be completely obtunded. Uh, and so you wanna try to figure out, is this something with a cardiac rhythm or its conduction or the cardiac muscle tissue? Uh, are they having an MI? Are they just dehydrated, right? And so look at syncope as one of those things that's uh, the pipe, the pumps, and the fluid. And if they have an adequate blood pressure and an adequate heart rate that's regular, uh, we would generally think that that's not a cardiac related cause. Now we'll get into the headaches, right? Again, I want everybody to kind of understand the difference, right? Mild headaches are not life changing events. Uh, and then this is just different types of uh, headaches in general, but some of these can be significant and present themselves uh, in such a manner that you might be concerned that this could be a stroke. And so we have tension headaches. These are muscle contractions in the head and the neck, and that's usually due to stress. People that like to grind their teeth a lot where they're just clenching, uh, that can cause headaches. Migraines, um, 
are generally thought to be caused by blood vessels that are kind of constricting, which makes the uh, pressure go up. Uh, and so that actually can be debilitating because uh, it's you are unable to control that. Most pain medications don't have a vasodilator or any kind of way to kind of treat that particular process. So they'll just generally mask the symptoms. Cluster headaches uh, are vasculature in nature and they just kind of occur in groups in different portions of the brain. And that particular small section of uh, vasculature may be spasming where it's constricting and creating an increase in pressure just in that particular part of tissue. This is just a review again of the brain is very sensitive to oxygen, glucose, and temperature, right? And so again, the brain cannot function in an anaerobic environment and it must have glucose. It is the one and only organ in the body that has to have glucose no matter what for fuel. The key is to look for these obvious and subtle changes in what would uh, take a pa person or a patient out of homeostasis. So just try to understand, again, I really, really like AEIU tips. If you're looking at that for any of the altered mentation, most of these symptoms should be able to present themselves to you. Your scene size up, this is just really you trying to grab clues, right? So if somebody's on Keppra or Dilatin, you know that that person is already epileptic. Uh, if this patient has long-standing history of high blood pressure, they're probably uh, a big candidate for some kind of stroke. If they had some kind of minor to moderate trauma, that may be another one of its uh, ways of presenting where we've got that subdural epidural bleed and that's causing the altered mentation. So again, use your scene to give you clues, right? Very rarely do people spontaneously just develop something out of nowhere and uh, you know, the unlucky few you're not going to be able to guess your way through it anyways. This is the decorticate and decerebate posturing that I was speaking about before. And in reality, what you need to know is that decorticate is the uh, lesser level of the two, right? Because the natural reflex to protect yourself is to bring your extremities into the core to protect your core organs. And then when somebody's decerebate posturing, uh, that is probably the last stage before they go completely unconscious and they have no reflexes left. When you're dealing with somebody who's unconscious or obtunded, your airway and breathing are your priority. Uh, obviously they should have a pulse and really want to make sure that that person is not going to uh, aspirate, whether that be saliva or vomit. And in the cases of uh, significant uh, head injuries, vomiting tends to happen quite a bit. Circulation, you know, the, if there's no pulse, it's now CPR and it's not really what we're talking about neuro at this point in time. Always when we have unstable patients, right? People who cannot protect their own airway, they're degrading. We just want a rapid transport. And, you know, I've said this in class before, uh, the person who made the saying of stay and play and load and go, I just disagree with it. I mean, we should be looking at what a patient needs and, you know, there's in regards to uh, taking your time on scene, that's because you don't have a life threat that's gonna kill them uh, right now and you can be a little bit more gentle in their care. But if we have somebody who's critical, we need to get them on the gurney in the back of the rig as soon as humanly possible in the safest manner possible. But remember, we're always looking for what's killing this patient right now. And so more often than not, transporting your patient quickly is the best option. History taking, again, is gonna give you a lot of clues as to what it is that you're dealing with. Because like I said just a little while ago, uh, very rarely do people just spontaneously develop this kind of altered mentation out of nowhere. There's usually historical events that have been leading up to this event today uh, for quite a while, and that could be in any regards to most things, right? Uh, it's very unlikely that somebody is gonna become uh, hypoglycemic in their 50s for no reason at all. I mean, that's just uh, something that's nonsensical. Uh, normal, young, healthy, uh, you know, adults uh, typically don't have a stroke unless they, uh, you know, have an aneurysm that ruptures and then it's a hemorrhagic stroke at that point and that's just really an unlucky event. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the high blood pressure or anything like that where somebody who's, um, 
you know, got quite a bit more years on them, say 60s, 70s, who's had chronic blood pressure problems. Uh, atrial fibrillation is one of the bigger ones that's a trigger for while this may be a stroke. Uh, all of these little pieces of history will kind of tell you what it is that's caused the event today. Make sure that you do your secondary assessment. You don't, again, we don't want you guys to sit there. If somebody is unstable doing a secondary assessment on scene, this can be done in the back of the rig. And we're looking for those subtle physical cues that are gonna tell us what's going on with neurologic signs and symptoms. And we're looking for injuries, right? And so if you can identify a stroke, that's great, but if somebody's completely obtunded and they're unable to answer your questions or follow any commands, we're really, really at the very base of what's happening and you need more help than trying to actually perform that assessment. Uh, it says use the common stroke assessment tool. Locally, we're very heavily dependent on the Cincinnati stroke scale. And once we have a positive Cincinnati, we go into the LAMS. And I encourage you guys to look that up. It's in your local protocol if you work in the system uh, that we're servicing immediately around this area. Uh, and it's beneficial for you to actually understand that. Your reassessments, I mean, this is generally just true of anything, right? We're always looking at what is the heart rate? Is the blood pressure moving up? Is it moving down? Is our respiratory rate and pattern staying the same or is it changing? Pulse oximetry and then glucose level monitoring, right? And so uh, take that with a, a little bit of uh, a grain of salt, right? So a blood glucose is good on the initial assessment, but unless you've given sugar or somebody's actively having a stroke, the sugar should probably not change very much and it's of no real benefit to you in the field. So serial uh, glucose readings are not really uh, something that you guys should be too worried about unless you have an indicator for it. Your GCS scores, eye, verbal, and motor, uh, you know, four, five, six, and we're always looking for that GCS of 15 or as high as possible, right? So um, people with a GCS of eight or less are unable to protect their airway. And so that's a huge uh, indicator that somebody is actually really far down in, into a pathway. Now, as somebody say is waking up out of a uh, seizure, right? They're coming from that post-tictal state. We wanna make sure that you're giving them that emotional support, right? They're gonna wake up, they're probably scared, they don't know what's happening because uh, that phenomenon takes them out of reality for just a little while, right? They're no longer uh, coherent. Uh, stroke symptoms, uh, some patients are able to actually understand what you're saying, they just can't communicate back. And so you wanna make sure that you're doing the right thing for the patient. and. Unfortunately, that's not always a lot of medical. That's just being there emotionally and making sure that they understand that you're doing everything you can in the best interest of the patient. Make sure that you always do an early uh, stroke notification on uh, any patient that's going to the receiving facility, right? You wanna get the appropriate team there so that they can get into a CT scan and get with the neurologist as quickly as possible. Time is tissue, regardless of whether or not that's brain or heart. And then always make sure that you're doing thorough documentation and be able to give that off in the handoff. In regards to dealing with hypoglycemia, we're able to give IV dextrose. And so most systems are adopting the D10 because it's just softer on the body. It doesn't create the massive swings in blood glucose levels. So make sure that you're able to actually give that or identify that that patient needs it. And you know we're titrating that to effect. All right, in regards to uh, treating people with hypoglycemia, uh, as an AEMT, you're able to use IV IO access to deliver glucose or dextrose. Uh, and that's typically dextrose if it's uh, through the IV or the IO and it's uh, glucose if it's orally, right? And this is based on whether or not somebody's able to actually uh, follow commands and protect their own airway. And then we also have the ability to give glucagon. Uh, but remember, we're, uh, one of the contraindications for glucagon is the inability to restore blood glucose levels. If you ask the liver to dump the last bit of glucose that it has in it, uh, you have to get them up and to a point where they're able to either uh, regenerate glucose by eating something uh, with high sugar levels immediately, or you're at some point gonna be able to get that IV or IO. Hypoglycemia is obviously more lethal than hyperglycemia, right? And so uh, if there's no circulating 
uh, blood sugar in the body, then the brain is going to have zero uh, nutrients being delivered to it for fuel, and the body is unable to actually create glucose uh, rapidly like that, right? We can't make that shift when somebody goes uh, ketogenic into it's doing its own glycogenesis. That's something that you take many days, if not weeks, to kind of develop that eating pattern where the body starts to create that. In a diabetic, uh, if they're uh, immediately or emergently hypoglycemic, that is a life-threatening event. Hyperglycemia uh, is a long-standing, kind of really long, drawn-out process that's used with dilution and uh, insulin to kind of treat. And those patients, uh, while they may be obtunded, are far less likely to die as a result. In this slide, we're talking about make sure that your IV line is patent before you try to give D50, right? And again, uh, D50 is in scope, but nobody's really utilizing D50 because it's actually um, shown to not be as beneficial as D10 and creates many, many complications. The take home message on that though, is that sugar is really necrotic to the tissue. Again, much like red blood cells, we wanna keep that sugar inside the vasculature. You wanna make sure that the uh, sugar is not in the soft tissue, right? So if we have a, a tear in the vein or we've infiltrated, that sugar will actually come up against the cells and because sugar will, is, uh, it will draw the, the water out of the cell, you can actually cause necrosis around the site of injury or where the sugar is. So make sure that you have a good flowing line and you don't have an infiltration before you give sugar. This says there's no safe way to lower high blood glucose levels in the field, and that's true, right? The only thing that we can do is give them a little bit of water, uh, which, you know, or I should say a little bit of saline, uh, which may help with your blood pressure issues or something like that, because if the uh, sugar concentration is so high that the blood is starting to become viscous, uh, that can actually cause some kind of uh, blood pressure issues. Uh, and we're not gonna go crazy with that. That's your standard saline dose for somebody who would otherwise look kind of dehydrated. So in care of stroke, we're looking at the administration of supplemental oxygen, right? We wanna make sure we, all of our red blood cells that are available are highly oxygenated. We wanna have IV access. And one of the things that you wanna make sure that you know is any patient who's a candidate for TPA must have an 18 gauge at the AC or higher for the TPA to work correctly, right? And so the way that that medication is administered is very specific. So if you are gonna start a, uh, a med line for the hospital that you're delivering to, make sure that you have that 18 or better uh, at the AC or higher, uh, which would be the, you know, into the bicep. Uh, if not, Make sure that you're very distal so that the staff can actually have access. You don't want to actually block their access. So this is, again, what we teach in class. We work distal to proximal, and we're always looking for appropriately sized um, venipuncture catheters, right? So we definitely don't want a 24 in the AC on an adult who's having a stroke. Here's your suspected stroke algorithm. Again, we're looking at somebody, are they altered? We're going to go through AEI tips. If we're leading towards the, wow, this looks like an obvious stroke, we want to make sure that we're going to kind of do that Cincinnati stroke scale, and then we're going to do a LAM score, and then we want to do early notification. The patient will often arrive in the ED. They're going to be taken to CT scan to see, is this a bleed or is it purely a uh, ischemic stroke? Because that's going to change, right? Uh, TPA, which is a clot buster, is not going to be given to somebody who has a hemorrhagic stroke because they're already bleeding into their brain. Uh, and so we don't want to actually make that process worse. If it is a clot or an ischemic stroke, then they're going to get TPA. Or now, uh, in the last couple of years, we have a stroke interventionists, which can actually send a catheter up into the brain to remove the clot manually. TIA, remember, these are going to have stroke-like symptoms. They're going to look just like a real stroke. Uh, and they are, by technicality, a real stroke. They're just self-resolving. You're going to treat them the same way. And that patient should know that even if they had stroke-like symptoms for 10, 15 minutes, uh, and then they've resolved, that is a like a warning shot across the bow. 
that, hey, a bigger event is likely to occur very soon. So in regards to seizures, we're looking at the, we want to make sure that we actually have a pretty good idea that this is a seizure. We want to treat that patient with oxygen because we want to get the, as much oxygen back to the brain so that it's not uh, experiencing any hypoxia. We don't want to have that hypoxic injury. Uh, definitely check the sugar on that particular patient. Very rarely does it turn up that that's uh, caused, but we just don't want to have that rule out. So uh, always make sure that that's part of your assessment package. And again, that's just following the AEIOU tips. Syncope, we're looking at this, is this uh, like what caused their fainting episode? And so we want to be very aggressive as far as getting a blood pressure, checking for a pulse, making sure that it's regular. If you have access to a cardiac monitor, you want to see, does the cardiac monitor show you a waveform that's regular or uh, irregular, or is it uh, throwing ectopic beats? And I don't expect everybody to, to know uh, a lot of the cardiology, but if it doesn't look normal, it's not normal. And that's pretty easy to see on any cardiac monitor, and uh, cardiac monitors are available all the way down to the EMT basic in our local scope. You just can't interpret a 12 lead. Headaches, again, you gotta determine, is this a run of the mill, kind of like I've got a tension headache, you know, I'm stressed out or I'm dehydrated, or is this a migraine? And is it so significant that it's causing somebody to vomit or have these kind of like auditory or visual hallucinations or kind of uh, excess stimulus? because these people are at risk for that hemorrhagic stroke. So that's all that we have for uh, the neurological emergencies. Again, these are very simple things for you guys to kind of come up with, right? Uh, just follow your altered mentation algorithm that I've said probably 25 times in this last lecture, but it is actually a core fundamental to understanding why somebody would be uh, uptunded or unresponsive.